The escalation of global terrorism, crime, immorality, and natural disasters seems to indicate our world is spiraling towards its ultimate hour with destiny. Who, if anyone, will survive Earth's final events? Discover what Bible prophecy reveals about the rapture, the mark of the beast, and Armageddon. Though shrouded in mystery for centuries, the book of Revelation can be understood today. Peer into the future and see what wonderful things God has planned for his people. And now, Pastor Brian McMahon presents the powerful Bible seminar, Revelation Speaks Hope. This morning's subject we've entitled the United States in Bible Prophecy. This is a subject this morning that you hardly ever hear talked about in church. And yet it's a very significant passage in the Word of God. And if God has placed it there in the stream of end time events and He expects us to know it and we should take time to study it. Amen? So we're going to do that this morning. Would you open up to the book of Revelation with me please? What does the Bible have to say about the United States in Scripture? Does it say anything at all? Does it describe the rise of America? Well, as we begin this morning, it's important to note that the Bible is not just predominantly a book of history. Does it have a lot of history? Absolutely it does. But it's not just history. Because if it was just history, we would say, well, what does the Bible say about Poland? Or what does the Bible say about Russia? Why doesn't the Bible mention every single country in the world? So no, the Bible doesn't mention every country. But the Bible mentions those specific nations that come into the plan of salvation or have a direct relationship upon his people. For example, for example, as we open up the Bible, we see the Garden of Eden. Why? Well, that's where Adam and Eve are. That's where his people are. So that's the area of the world that is focused on. Later on, of course, we see areas of the world like Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Why? Again, because these areas of the world bear a direct relationship to where God's covenant people are. After, of course, Jesus ascended to heaven, we see the gospel going out to the world, and we see places like Asia Minor where Paul takes his missionary journey. But yet we would expect America to be mentioned in Scripture, not just because it's a political nation, but because for the first time, a nation has risen up with different kind of principles. Principles that nations before did not enjoy. Principles of freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. In Revelation chapter 14, we see God's last final warning message going to all the world, culminating in the second coming of Jesus. Revelation 13 then is a connecting link. It first takes us back to the time of the Dark Ages and shows us some of what went on there. And then it takes us forward in time all the way back up to the closing scenes and shows us what's going to happen just before Jesus returns. A very important passage here. So in Revelation chapter 13, we find a lot of information. And we also find that the mark of the beast is going to be strictly enforced. It says in Revelation 13 and verse 16, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So those who don't receive the mark of the beast, they'll be boycotted, they'll be punished, eventually they'll be threatened with death. But those who do receive the mark of the beast, they're in trouble too. Because we read about that last night in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, where it says, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And so this has been the issue with God's people throughout time, throughout the centuries. They've always had to decide between will they serve God and take what man gives with God as their protection. Revelation 13, we'll begin here in verse 1 if we could. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and deceit and great authority. Now we have thoroughly covered the identity of this power in our prophecy seminar. The papacy is described here as having the features of these other beasts or these other kingdoms because it emerged from those kingdoms and it took its identity from much of the religion that survived on from them, from those previous kingdoms. So let's go down to verse 3 if we could please. And in verse 3 it says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now the Bible tells us that one of the characteristics of this power is that it's going to reign supreme for 1260 years. And at the end of 1260 years, it's going to receive a wound 
so significant that it would be referred to as a mortal wound or a deadly wound. And we found out that that is referring to the time that the papacy ruled from 538 all the way down to 1798. In 1798, Napoleon sent his general Berthier down into the heart of the Vatican. There they took the Pope captive. They confiscated the property and declared it a republic and everything in Europe, everyone in Europe thought that the papacy was over, that it was finished, that it would no longer reign. The scholars of the day thought the papacy was finished. But the Bible prophecy went on, and it tells us that the deadly wound would be what? Would be healed. And so the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, is that the deadly wound would be healed and things would start to change after a while. Now in Revelation 13, 9 and 10, it tells us, If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So what it's telling us here is that because the papacy put people into captivity, it too will go into captivity for a period of time. It goes on in Revelation 13 and it says, He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. What it's saying is here is the endurance during that special terrible time of persecution that's going to go on. What Revelation is doing here, friends, is positioning us in time. In Revelation 13 verse 10, it tells us the time that the first beast goes into captivity. That is 1798. So when we know that the first beast is going into captivity, now we see another beast coming onto the prophetic scene here in verse 11. Many people don't realize, as they call this the Antichrist chapter, that there are actually two beasts mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. So often we talk about the one, we don't mention the other. Revelation 13 and verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast. So as the first beast is going into captivity, another beast is coming up on the scene of history. And this morning we're going to study about this second beast of Revelation 13. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So sometime around 1798, sometime around the time that the first beast is going into captivity, we've got another beast, and he's coming up out of the what? Out of the earth. I want to hear you this morning, just like I hear you at night. Those are coming. Okay. The second beast is coming up out of the what? Earth. Thank you. And he's got two horns like a what? Like a lamb. And he spake as a what? Spake as a dragon. The second beast comes up out of the earth. And the first beast came up out of the what? Up out of the water, out of the seas. So we've got the first beast coming up out of the seas. The second beast coming up out of the water. There are some questions we need to answer about this second beast. We want to know where this power arises in the world. We want to know when this power arises in the world. And we want to know how this power arises because by answering these questions, we can get a very good identity of what is being spoken about here. Revelation 17, verse 15, it tells us, And he saith unto them, unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and what? And tongues. And so waters represent multitudes of people. So that's very plain. Of course, that's actually very common language. If you have a lot of people assembled in one place, we often call it a sea of people. So that's common usage. We're used to that even in our English language. So a beast represents a kingdom. We found that out in Daniel 7, verse 17 and verse 23. So when you see a beast coming up out of the sea or out of the waters, you see a kingdom rising up over multitudes of people, the great sea of humanity. And of course, that exactly describes what the papacy did. The papacy grew up over there in Europe, over there among many civilizations. And the second beast, it says, comes up out of the earth. Now, the world is basically made up of two components, right? The world, as it says to, for us today, it basically is made of two components, the land and the sea. So if the first beast comes up out of the sea, the second one comes up out of the land, and the sea represents a very densely populated area of the world, what would the land represent? Well, it would represent the opposite, wouldn't it? It would represent a very sparsely populated area of the world. So the beast comes up out of the sea over the peopled areas of Europe. This power would not come up in a very peopled area of the world. It would have to come up in a very sparsely populated area. So let's go to Revelation 12 and look at verse 14. It says in verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now let's keep reading verse 15. And the devil cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And then verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. In Bible prophecy, 
what does a woman represent? A church, that's right. So a woman represents a church. Now we get that from scriptures such as 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, where it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So what are we being told here? We're being told that the church is married to Jesus just as a bride is married to a husband. So, yes, the church is compared to a woman in Bible prophecy. When you see a very chaste woman represented, you're seeing a very pure church, a pure faith. When you see a corrupt woman represented, as you do in Revelation chapter 17, you're seeing an apostate church being represented. Now, when we see a woman fleeing into the wilderness, you're seeing the church, because of persecution that is coming upon it, fleeing underground. It's going into hiding. It's going into obscurity because of the fact that the visible church is persecuting it. And, of course, we know that during the Dark Ages, Faithful groups like the Waldensians and the Albigenses and the Huguenots and these faithful worshipers of God had to flee into remote places up in the Italian Alps and the French mountains and these kind of places in order to have a place where they could worship God according to their own consciences, according to Scripture. If they came out into the visible areas, they would be killed. And so, yes, the church fled from the face of the serpent. And then it says in verse 15, And the devil cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. What do the flood waters represent? In Isaiah 59 and verse 19, we get an answer to that. It says, when the enemy shall come in like a what, friends? Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So the enemies of the church are compared to flood waters. So now we find that the flood waters are coming after God's people. The rescue plan comes in verse 16 of Revelation chapter 12. And verse 16 says, and the, woman, and the earth rather helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So the earth, like a dry sponge, was able to soak up the flood waters. Satan cast all of this persecution out of his mouth. God opened up a rescue area of the world, and the Bible tells us that it's called the earth. In other words, it's some new place. Some specific place of the world was opened up where God's people could flee to. Now, the second question is, when did this power arise? Well, we've already answered that. Uh, it says the papacy went into captivity in 1798, and at the same time that the papacy was going into captivity, somewhere around that time, a young nation was coming up. And so we're told that this nation had two horns like a lamb. So it's going to be a young nation sometime around 1798, sometime around, or some, some, some area of the world, rather, that's unpopulated, we're going to see a nation rise up. The third question is, how does this power arise? Because it says it has lamb-like horns, we wouldn't expect it to be as ferocious as these other beasts that are talked about in the book of Revelation. The beasts of Daniel 7 were all beasts of prey, weren't they? And the beasts of prey, they conquer other nations they devour them in a ferocious way, you know, through wars and such like things. They, they devour people and they, in turn, are devoured. But this one is different. It doesn't have that same kind of ferocious nature. Jesus is symbolized by a lamb because God's principles are different than the world's principles. Amen? You see? There's no force here. There's no coercion. With Jesus, there's no reason to fear, and I appreciate that. The prophecies are written in symbolic language, and therefore it's very important that the symbol be a correct symbol so we will apply it in the right way and come up with the right answer. And this nation grows into power rather than conquering some other advanced civilization. Now, the first beast that rose up there that we know as the papacy, it had ten horns representing the ten divisions of Europe, and what were on the horns? Crowns were on the horns. Thank you. Stay with me on this. Crowns were on the horns. Now, the second beast that comes up out of the earth is different. Crowns represent kingly authority. It came up over there in Europe, and of course, monarchies were reigning all over the countries of Europe. But the second beast that comes up out of the earth, it has two horns, but it has no crowns on the horns. There's a notable absence here, isn't there? So by the absence of, of crowns, meaning there is no ruling king or no monarchy, we now have the understanding that this kingdom is going to be ruled by the people. It's going to have freedom that these other nations did not have. 
we have a prophecy that deals with a nation coming up, arising around 1798, around the time that the first beast goes into captivity. We find that it is arising in a relatively unpopulated area, given the fact that it is coming up out of the earth and not the sea. It's going to be a young nation, given the fact that the horns are lamb-like, and also because it's lamb-like, it would espouse Christ-like principles. It also would have no crowned head, meaning no kingly authority. It's going to be ruled by the people. And also it would arise to a position of worldwide power, worldwide influence. Well, after going through these five rather quick but very telling identifying marks, we can come to only one conclusion as to what we're talking about. The only nation that was rising to power in and around 1798 in a relatively unpopulated area of the world with these kind of principles as its foundation is what we call, of course, the United States of America. The United States of America. A new power in a new society is how the Bible describes this nation. Now, the Bible tells us that it was in a relatively unpopulated area of the world. Yes, there were people here, no doubt about it, but there weren't multitudes of people here, and that's the difference that we're talking about. N Satan sent out a flood of persecution upon the church over in Europe. And in order to flee the religious persecution that was there, the founders of this nation came over to find another country. In order to know the, the history of the United States, you need to know how it was founded. Now, many times people came over here afterward for financial reasons, but in the beginning, it wasn't financial. In the beginning, it was because of religious persecution. And so, yes, we find that the pilgrims came over on the Mayflower, and when they came over on the Mayflower, they knelt down on their knees on the shores of America, and they thanked God for a country where they could worship as they desired. Amen? They wanted to be free from the chains of persecution. They saw what happened when you had a church-state system over there in Europe, so they wanted a country without a king, and they wanted a church without a pope. What do you say? That's what they desired. And it is over here in this nation that they found refuge. They found a place that truly they could worship as they felt the Bible taught them. Abraham Lincoln, I love how he said it. He said it was to be a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And this prophecy that shows us what's going on here, it pictures the woman fleeing with two wings as of a great what? Eagle. And isn't it interesting that the United States has chosen as its emblem the great eagle? And I find that, I think that's more than just coincidence that that has taken place. Now, the United States then, historically, geographically, religiously, and politically, all fit the identifying marks here in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. Now, the horns, again, would be lamb-like, so it was to be a power that was to be Christ-like. Now, it is true that this nation hasn't always had peace. It has had war, but it's a nation that desires peace. It's a nation that desires to live in a peaceful way with the world. Now, America was built on different kinds of principles than the nations that came before it. Let me share with you what some of the founding fathers had to say about what they desired to see in this country. And of course, the first one would be from George Washington, the first American president. And he said this, every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own conscience. Amen? This is what George Washington had to say. Now, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the great Civil War hero and later became a president of the United States after Abraham Lincoln, he said this. He said, leave the, the matter of religious teaching to the family altar. The church and the private school supported entirely by private contributions. Keep the church and state forever separate. Now, one thing we want to mention as we read these kinds of quotes, the founding fathers believed in God. And the founding fathers desired to see this nation built on Christ-like principles. They desired to see the principles of Christianity at work in our society. But they did not want to see religion mandated by the government. Amen? Amen. See, that's the difference. They believed in God. They believed in the Bible. And they believed in the principles of the Bible. And they longed to see a nation established along the lines of the principles of the Bible. But they saw what happened over there in Europe when you mandated religion. You see, when you mandate religion, it's okay if you're in the majority and you believe what's being mandated, but when you're in the minority, watch out. Then you're in real trouble, you see. So what we're seeing here is that the founding fathers believed in religious freedom. And this nation has grown and prospered because of two main principles that we believe are represented by those two horns on the second beast of Revelation 13. The main principle, number one, civil liberty, freedom from the tyranny of a king, and number two, religious liberty, freedom from the tyranny of a pope. 
what about the future of the United States? Does the Bible teach that the freedoms that we have long enjoyed here in this nation will continue on into the future? What does prophecy reveal? That's the question for us here. Let's go to Revelation 13 again, and this time, once again, read verse 11. And it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a what again? Like a dragon. This once Christ-like nation that started out so well ultimately speaks as a dragon. So what we're reading is that it really is a dragon in sheep's clothing. It is, a, it is a lamb for a while, but the nature changes. It seems like such a contradiction in terms, but a change is going to take place. So when it says it speaks like a dragon, what's happening here? What's going on is the Bible is attributing man-like characteristics to a nation. If a nation is going to speak, how does a nation speak? It says the nation is going to speak. We need to know how a nation speaks. Well, a nation speaks through the laws that it legislates, through its Congress, through its halls of Congress. And when it says it's going to cause, that means it's going to enforce. Let's look at this next verse up here. Revelation 13 and verse 12. It says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What we're seeing here, dear friends, is God's headlines for the future. You ever thought of it that way? Uh, the evening news in advance. I don't know how many of you watch the evening news, but when you get the evening news, you're getting what's happening that day. But here we're finding out that this is for the headlines for the future. Isn't that right? The United States, it begins in such a noble way, begins in such an innocent way, eventually returns back to the spirit of religious intolerance. It shows that that old dragon, the devil himself, is going to get his dirty claws right into the heart of Protestant America, and through working in this country, he's going to turn the government in such a way that it's going to revert back to the style of the old world Europe. So the new world, as it was often called, reverts eventually back to the style of the old world in trampling upon the rights of people's consciences. Here it's predicted that Protestant America reaches its hand across the Gulf. It clasps the hand of Papal Europe, and there's going to be a coalition. Now notice, in the prophecy, it doesn't say that the first beast, the papacy, is going to do all the work. It's the second beast that's going to do the work in the sight of the first beast. So if you ever have any doubt that these two nations are working together, all you have to do is take a look at what's going on in the news. Do we have an ambassador from the United States to the Baptist Church of America? No. Do we have one to the Presbyterian Church of America? No. Do we have one to the Adventist churches in America? No. Do we have one to the Vatican? Yes, we do. Why? Because it's not just a church. It's a church-state system. Now, this one former ambassador, understanding the relationship between these two powers, the United States and the Vatican, had this to say. He said, I believe that the United States, as the world's only superpower, and the Holy See, that's the officials of the Vatican, as the only worldwide political sovereignty, have significant roles in to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. This man did not understand how prophetic his words actually were. Working closer and closer together, these two powers are going to impact what goes on in the future. Now let's go back, if we could, to verse 12 of Revelation chapter 13. Verse 12, and it says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to, what's that next word? Worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship, there it is again, the image of the beast should be killed. Now, who's doing the speaking? It says he's going to speak and cause. Well, the United States is going to do the speaking. Is not the United States the lone superpower of the world tonight? Absolutely, it is. Is not the United States the, the lone influential spokesperson for the world? It absolutely is. Now, what's this spokesperson power going to say? Listen carefully to verse 14. It says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth. So the United States is going to speak to nations everywhere. And what is he going to say? That they should make an image 
to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Once again, this is far in advance of the evening news, isn't it? When it says that there's going to be an image to the beast, what exactly is this image that's being talked about here? Well, an image is a likeness. So there's going to be a political likeness made to the beast, the papal church-state system of coercion, we could say. That's been, it's going to be set up, it's going to be established right here in beautiful America. And it says that it's done in the sight of the beast. So once again, it's not the beast power that does all the work in the last days. It's going to be this second power that legislates and enforces law in the presence of the beast. That's what prophecy is saying. In other words, the United States is going to create an image to the beast. It, it doesn't mean that everyone in the United States is going to become Catholic, but it means that the United States will begin to image what the first beast was all about. Now, I'm trying to say it several ways so that there's no misunderstanding. The first beast, the papacy, enforced religious law, didn't they? That's, that's what they've been known for throughout the centuries. Essentially, there's no separation of church and state there. Church and state are one when you talk about the papacy. One thing I love about our God is he is not a God of force. Amen? You see? see, God does not try to force people to love him. It's the devil who forces, isn't it? God respects human freedom. God respects the ability of people to make a choice for themselves who they want to serve. Now, the first beast, the papacy, once again enforced religious law. And when we see in this country the image of the beast, what we're seeing is that we're going to see leaders in America, in the churches of America, go to the political leaders of the country, and they're going to say something along the lines of, we need to get this nation back to God. And so what you're seeing is there will be a dismantling of the current system of separation of church and state by well-meaning but misinformed, misguided people who say, let's get our country back to God. Let's legislate religious law. That's the result of religion gone bad, friends. When religion is good, it's one thing. When religion goes bad, it's quite another. Now, Benjamin Franklin was a very astute reasoner. And Benjamin Franklin said this, when religion is good, it will take care of itself. When it is not good, and I'm sorry, when it does not care, take care of, let me start again. When it is not able to take care of itself, and God does not see fit to take care of it, so that it has to appeal to the civil power for support, it's evidence in my mind that the cause is a bad one. He was a pretty astute reasoner, wasn't he? Benjamin Franklin understood that if religion is proper, God will sustain it. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, not force. And when someone has to force their religion upon another person, you know that something is not right with it. Now, in an attempt to get moral values back to this country, the laws will go too far by legislating something that Bible commandment-keeping Christians cannot go along with. If you want to know what the image of the beast is going to be like, well, friends, all you have to do is look back in history and see what was the image of the beast, or what was the beast like, rather, in the time of the Dark Ages. In the time of the Dark Ages, when pagan teachings and pagan practices were drawn into the church, the Holy Spirit departed from the church because the Holy Spirit cannot endorse error. And when the Holy Spirit departed from the church, in order to mandate what they wanted to do, they went to the civil power and they said, we want you to back us up. And then you have the beast power. Now, the beast power, we've already talked about it in our seminar, is built on certain principles. One is that they claim to take God's place on earth. And because they claim to take God's place on earth, they claim to be able to enforce religious law. They say they have that right and authority. With one particular person, one particular Catholic, C.S. Thomas, Chancellor Cardinal Gibbons, he said this, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, speaking of the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. He says, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So they're saying, we have God's place on earth. We can make religious law. And the fact that we have changed the Sabbath is a mark of that authority. Because if we have made that change and the churches of the earth basically go along with this, then that shows that we can make religious law. One more from the Catholic record here. It says, the church is above the Bible, speaking of the Catholic Church. It says, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Now, friends, Sunday keeping has nothing to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with paganism. Paganism gave it over to papalism, we might call it, 
and papalism gave it over to Protestantism. And Protestantism is keeping it today as a tradition, not as a principle of Scripture. Now, the Bible doesn't forbid the worship of God on any day. But when religion is forced upon people by law, now you've got the makings of the mark of the beast and the image to the beast. Revelation chapter 13 is where we've been studying this morning. It's speaking now of a worldwide monetary control coming upon God's people down at the end of time in order to try to force them to come into compliance with this issue, this issue of Sunday keeping. When a nation becomes more and more engulfed in disasters, when more and more problems come upon the economy, natural disasters start to occur, people start to get worried. And when people start to get insecure, they're willing to sell out freedoms in order to have security. The final showdown is going to come between true and false worship. And it says in Revelation 13 that a mark will come upon those who compromise upon their forehead or on their right hand. Now, I, said that, I shared this last night, but let me briefly go through it right now. When it says that there's going to be a mark upon the forehead or on the right hand, what are we talking about? We're talking about in the forehead meaning that these people have intellectually sold out their allegiance to the beast's power. They're thinking like the beast. They believe that God's law either can be done away with or God's law can be changed or altered somehow to fit their particular liking. They're thinking rebellion like the beast is a power of rebellion against God. But the ones who receive it on the hand, that's a different issue. They're acting out rebellion. They may not agree with what the issues are. They might not agree with what the law says, but they're going to go along with it anyway. That is forced compliance. Once again, the devil doesn't care how he gets it. Isn't that right? The devil doesn't care if he can get you to believe it or if he can never get you to believe it as long as he can force you to go along with the issue. So some will get it in the forehead and some will get it in the hand. Some people will say, well, I'm sincere in what I'm doing. I may not be doing according to all what the Bible says, but I'm sincere in what I'm doing, and therefore God's going to see me through. doesn't matter. They'll just get the mark on the forehead. People will intellectually try to convince God's people to go down a wrong road. And friends, don't be mistaken. They will put forth some powerful arguments before it's all through. They'll put forth arguments like this. They'll say, well, we've got terrorism in our world. And we've got bombs dropping all over in streets of certain cities. And we've got drugs running rampant. And we've got abortions constantly. And we've got runaway immorality and crime and violence. Terrible violence going on. So with all of these things happening, the powers that be will say, why don't we just drop our differences? Why don't we just forget all these things that separate us? And we're just going to join hands and we're going to sing. We're one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. And, and, and if the majority of people go to church on Sunday, why don't we just go to church on Sunday? And friends, it's going to be very, very difficult to go against the popular flow. Many people succumb because of what we might call peer pressure. If September 11th, 2001 has taught us anything, it's taught us how quickly a diverse nation can come together under a certain cause. This nation came together in a hurry. A war on terrorism can be applauded, but prophecy speaks that the world's last remaining superpower will not always be just, as sad as that is. Its lamb-like power of freedom and democracy will turn and it, can be, it, it will speak like a ferocious dragon in the future. Some laws can be passed very quickly under crisis situations. Let me share with you what some of the current political leaders are talking about even as we sit here this morning. Pat Robertson, of course, you know who he is, very popular person. He, of course, became the founder of the Christian Coalition. In his book, The New World Order, Pat Robertson said this, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated, notice the wording, a day of rest, speaking of Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of church and state. He goes on, as an outright insult to God and his plan, only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. So he's lamenting the fact that they don't have mandated Sunday laws right now. We used to have them, and he's saying we need them now. It goes on, Jerry Falwell has something to say on this. You know who he is, very popular religious leader in America. He's on television all the time voicing his opinion. 
He said all Americans would do well to petition the president and the Congress to make a federal law, that's a national law, an amendment to the Constitution if need be to establish the Sabbath as a national day of rest. Now friends, when he says Sabbath, he doesn't mean the seventh day. He's talking about Sunday, the first day of the week. But even if he did talk about the seventh day, we still wouldn't want it mandated. Amen? You see? It still would be wrong either way. Once again, Pat Robertson had to say, it's not the duty of any particular church or group of people. It's not the duty of the church, but it's the duty of the government, he says, of its people to thus proclaim a day as Sabbath to be universally observed throughout the length and breadth of our land. Sunday as the Lord's day. If we as a nation would escape the doldrums of increased trouble as God's hand rests heavily upon his people, opposition to Sunday nationally declared must cease. Even one of the former editors of Christianity Today weighed in on this, and of course this is a very popular magazine. It may be the most influential magazine in the Christian world. And it says in this magazine, speaking of this editor, he said, all businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat, it means by a, by a law, through the duty elected officials of the people. Even the Supreme Court Justice, Justice William Rehnquist, recently went on record in saying that the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. You know when the Chief Justice starts to speak that way that the fulfillment of this prophecy is not far off in the future, friends. Church and state will unite once again in this country. One particular man, Ed Dobson, not to be confused with Dr. James Dobson, a focus on the family, but Ed Dobson, he looked through these issues and he saw the real bottom line problem and notice what he says in this book, Blinded by Might. He said, whenever the church cozies up to political power, it loses sight of its all-important mission to change the world from the inside out. He goes on, in blurring the lines between politics and Christianity, the religious right has traded the only power that can truly change America, the gospel's power to transform hearts, for the methods of a kingdom that is not of this world. Friends, this man had it right. If, if a people of a nation are not wanting to live in a righteous way, no law and no Congress can make a person righteous. Amen? Because righteousness comes how? Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is only as we surrender our hearts to the Holy Spirit can He truly make us righteous. That's the duty of the gospel, you see. That's the work of the gospel. It is the duty of God's people to go out and preach the gospel. Churches today are coming together at an enormous speed, aren't they? I mean, rapid fire speed. Churches today are dropping those differences that they once had, trying to unite on points that they have in common. For example, we have articles about the Lutherans and the Episcopalians uniting. You've got Catholics meeting with the Orthodox. You've got Baptists and other groups meeting in America. Basically, at such a rapid pace, you can hardly keep up with who's joining who and who's meeting with who. One particular article, uh, one that one I think really bears upon what we're speaking of this morning, we are one, says Robertson, after meeting with Cardinal O'Connor. Now notice what the language says. It says, once bitter enemies on the theological battlefield, evangelical Protestants and conservative Roman Catholics are finding common ground on the, what scene? Political scene, that's right. Now, in his book, Politically Incorrect, Ralph Reed had to say, perhaps the most encouraging is the new ecumenism, that means the coming together of the churches, that permeates the pro-family community. He says, the union of Roman Catholics and conservative Protestants could have a greater impact on, impact on American politics than on any coalition since African Americans and Jews came together during the Civil Rights Movement. So he's saying this union of coming together, it's not just a union in order to solve our theological problems. It's a union that we might have an impact on what? Politics, right? How the laws in this nation are legislated. When the United States shall enforce Sunday, Sunday observance, which Rome claims is the special acknowledgement of her supremacy, now you've got an image made to the beast. All of these churches coming together in unity are for the purpose of being able to mandate their desires to the people. So God's people, no matter what, cannot go along with this kind of a system. There are faithful Christians who see through the masquerade there are faithful Christians who are going to see at the end time the true nature of Antichrist. And as they see through the true nature of Antichrist, I believe, and this is the good news, is that multitudes are going to take their stand on the right side of the issues before it's all over. Do you agree with that? But as these churches come together, 
there's no doubt what church is going to be at the head of it all. Recently, in the year 2000, this article came out. One of the closest aides of the Pope said, and this is through the Associated Press, it said, one of Pope John Paul II's closest aides has written to bishops worldwide declaring that the Catholic Church is the mother of other Christian churches. In the document, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger told the bishops that it was incorrect to refer to Christian churches ranging from Orthodox to Protestant as sister churches of the Catholic Church. He says it must always be clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister but the mother of all churches. Now, friends, the Bible has something to say about that in Revelation 17, doesn't it? It calls that last day power the mother of harlots. It's one thing for religious leaders to influence government, but it's another for them to take over government and start to legislate what they do. If history teaches us anything, it's that the greatest persecution that comes upon people is the persecution that comes when religious leaders control the government. Now, Satan's plan is not to do away with everything, because if Satan did away with everything, it wouldn't fool people. So Satan's plan is not to come with some kind of package that looks evil and try to pawn that off on people. Satan's plan is to come with a package that looks very good. It has a lot of good principles in it. You see, when you see people like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell and, and Dr. James Dobbs and these kind of people will talk about the issues, friends, we could agree with so much of what they talk about. Amen? I mean, so they, they believe in family values. They're against abortion. They believe that we need to bring morals back to this country. They believe in the same things we believe in. But friends, the Bible teaches that unfortunately some of these leaders are going to take these issues and they're simply going to go too far with them. They're going to go too far. And the fact that, an er that a movement that has error in it also has a lot of good with it is not an excuse to accept the error. You can take a glass of orange juice you know, and, and put some poison in it and make, mix it up so it looks really good still, but you still don't want to take it. In the same way, Satan will come along with what looks like a lot of good, and he'll say, here, this is best for the country, but it's got a poison pill in it. And God's people cannot go along with it because God's people realize you cannot have true revival while at the same time you're disobeying the express commandments of God. Amen. We can't do it. People today are being told to unify. They're saying, unify, unify, unify. Jesus wants unity among his people. But Jesus never said, compromise to achieve unity. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus wants us to come into conformity to his word, and by doing that, we will have true unity. We will have true unity. Friends, once again, this is coming. Why hasn't it come so far? Because God is holding back the winds, isn't he? God is merciful to us all. As we sit here this morning, God is giving us extra time to get right with him. Did you know that? God is giving you and giving me extra time to come into obedience to his principles. He's giving us extra time to prepare for these issues that are soon to come upon the world. Now, people will say, oh, it's never going to happen. How could people accept this plan that will come from the government? I'll show you how it will happen. Go to Revelation 13 and verse 13. Revelation 13 and verse 13. And here it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those, what? Miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So friends, in other words, miracles are what Satan is going to use to unify people under a canopy of error. Because of the lawlessness that is present, he cannot get them to be reading Scripture, so he turns their eyes away from Scripture, and he says to them, look at the miracles, look at the healings, look at the tongue speaking, look at the, uh, uh, the healings that are going on, and he's going to get them under these false revivals to believe that the Holy Spirit is among them. There are two great revivals that are going to take place in the end of time, dear friends. One is genuine, and one is false. The genuine is going to be based on the Word of God, the false is going to be based on miracles. Have you noticed that in recent times you're seeing one particular church come to the forefront and it's always talking about Mary and the miracles of Mary and wonders that are going on in this church around the world? It doesn't take very much to see that the, that the devil is focusing people on this power. Uh, this particular uh, magazine, The Meaning of Mary, Mary, a whole article simply on Mary's role. Well, friends, the Bible doesn't concentrate on Mary 
No, not after the birth of Jesus and the raising of Jesus. It doesn't concentrate on her. But of course, people are being told to look at her. This, this next picture I cut out of Life magazine. You say a picture is worth a thousand words. Here you see this picture of Mary now, and she's being adored and worshipped. Of course, you'd think that it would, should be Jesus being adored and worshipped, but it's not. People are being directed not to Jesus through this movement, but of course to Mary. And if Mary is supposedly working signs and wonders, then people get off on these miracles and they don't find what the truth is. The Bible says in Exodus 23 and verse 2, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Amen? No matter what the masses do, no matter what the popular group says, no matter what the majority of churches do, Revelation saints have to follow the Word of God, okay? no matter what it says. Now, what exactly is the image of the beast? When the leading churches of the United States unite on such points of doctrine as held by them in common, and they influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain them, then you've got Protestantism forming the image to the beast. And that's what the Bible says is going to be happened. And what's the result of this image of the beast? The infliction of penalties to those who will not go along. Now, lest that worry you in any way, I sure hope you will come tonight. Because tonight in our study of Armageddon, the seven last plagues, we're going to study all about the time of tribulation. And it's one of my absolute favorite topics to study in the seminar because it's all about how God's marvelous power is going to be with his people to go through the time of tribulation. Amen? Fantastic study. I sure hope you will come. The early church became corrupted, friends when it left the Word of God. And in the end, the Protestant churches are also leaving the Word of God. And they're following after many other like things that seem to be popular. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, that in the last days many will say to him, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then, of course, he's going to answer them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And the word iniquity there literally means lawlessness. So the one is based on the Word of God, the one revival, and the other, of course, is based on a false revival. How does God prepare the world then to understand the issues? In Acts 5 and verse 32, we read this, And we are His witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that do what? Obey Him. The Holy Ghost is not given to those who want to be disobedient to the Word. But God wants His people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, where is our focus going to be? In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, it says, To the law and to the what? Testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because what? There's no light in them. And so God is going to send a message to all the world, helping people to see the true issues in his law. And that's the message of Revelation 14, isn't it? And that's your work and that's my work this morning, to preach a true message that people will be able to see through all of this darkness and confusion that's out there. In the time of the Dark Ages, God had many faithful martyrs. And one of the issues of the Dark Ages, and it still is an issue today, though people are not necessarily dying for it like they did then, but the priest would claim to change the communion host, the communion bread, into the actual body of Jesus. The Protestants would say it's an emblem, it's just a symbol of the body of Jesus. But the Catholic Church said, no, the priest has the power to change it into the actual body of Jesus. And this became such a controversy that people would actually be burned alive at the stake if they would not agree with the church. And they would take these people and they would tie them to the stake and they would put the wood around their feet and then they would say, oh, we're going to give you one more chance. And they would hold up the host to them once again and they would say, do you believe that this is the actual body of Jesus? And all they would have to do to spare their life would be say, yes, I believe it. And they would be let go. But because they knew what the Bible said and they wanted to be true to Jesus, they would say, no, I don't believe it. And they would light the fire and another martyr would give their life for the truth. Scripture says, what does it profit a man? What does it profit a woman if we gain the whole world and lose our soul? Amen. What, is it, what does it profit us? Just like in the days of old, God desires us to take a stand for truth, doesn't he? Amen. We know these issues are coming. We know that the Bible is true and can be relied upon. One of the great Christian hymns is that hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. See, these words from hymns like this come out of their experience. They, they wrote out the things that the Christian church had passed through, and we ought not to forget that. 
brothers and sisters. In the first verse of this hymn, Faith of Our Fathers, it says, Faith of our fathers living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till what? Till death. How about you this morning, friends? Will you still be true to Jesus to death? Do you still want to hold on to the true faith of Scripture? Amen. Then I want you to stand with me right now as we sing this hymn. You up in the balcony, please stand too. We're going to sing this through, and I've got Charles here to help me. Now, friends, this morning, before we sing this hymn, many of you are here with a burden on your heart. You may have a burden that you need special prayer for. Now, I know we had a prayer time earlier. I, re I recognize that. But when we study verses like this and we talk about issues like this, this is the time to make commitments, is it not? This is the time to come to church for renewal and commitment to God so that we leave here different than when we walked in. As we sing these verses, I would like you to come forward this morning and I want to pray with those here this morning, and I know there should be many of you, that perhaps something in your life is such a burden that you want to have a special prayer for it. I don't know, maybe there's something in your life that you feel is, is hindering you from making a full commitment. It might be a spouse, it might be some peer pressure, it might be a job situation. It might be something far other than what I've mentioned, but you would like to have special prayer for it. So if we sing this, just come forward right down here. We're going to meet together and we're going to have a prayer afterward that God can certainly bless your life and help you to live the Spirit-filled life. Let's sing this with all our hearts and just come forward. You in the balcony, if you want to come forward, please start moving now. Take you a while to get down here, okay? It's going to take you an extra minute, so you just come down right now and that way we can all meet together. Don't feel you're left out because you're way up there, all right? We don't want to leave you out either. So come forward as the angels meet with us here. Let's sing this, Charles. All of you together. Those of you who have come forward, come right up to the stairs here. We want to make some room for some others to come. That's the way. We thank you for that. Those of you who are still coming, come on down. Don't be afraid to come down. If you're coming down, you're saying, Lord, I have a special desire to live this life, to stand for truth. And I think that's what God expects when we meet together, doesn't it, right? To say, I am going to take a stand on the right side of these issues, and I need special prayer in order to do that. And that's what God is longing for us to do. Let's keep singing this verse next two. verse. We'll singing verse two. Here we go. Come forward. one more verse to sing. This is a marvelous hymn, isn't it? The words of this hymn are very, very special. It's why I chose it this morning as we finish this important subject. Once again, it's a subject that you don't hear spoken of very much. It's kind of, kind of a complicated one to go through, as you know. But it's one that helps us to realize that we're not to just go through church and play church or pretend to be on God's side or pretend to be Christians. We have to really be Christians, amen? We have to be Christians in heart as well as in word. And so that's why by coming forward like this, it's important to be able to make these decisions and say, Lord, I do need help, or I do have something in my life I need special prayer for. It's not saying that any of us are weaker than the others. It's just saying, Lord, I, I want your, your spirit in my heart and life. And so we have one more verse to sing. It's not too late to come forward. We hope that some of you will, because we want to have a special prayer for all of you here 
that God is going to bless us as a people before we leave. Let's sing this last verse. As I close for prayer here, uh, with prayer, I want you, after we finish, just to stay uh, where you are for just one moment, because I know Pastor Mike has an announcement that he'd like to make, okay? So we're going to have closing prayer, and if you just stay, stay standing, don't move, we're going to have our closing announcements. Is Pastor Mike close by? I hope he is. Okay. Father in heaven, this morning we realize that you call us all to commitment you call us all to be Christians, as this verse has said, in heart and in deed. How sweet would it be, Lord, if we were called to give the ultimate sacrifice as many millions have in the past. We don't know if that might be the situation in the future. We realize that things are going to really be trying before Jesus comes back. How much we need to make commitments. Some of us, Lord, have fear in our hearts this morning. Perhaps that is the situation with some that has come forward or you may be some even that haven't. But Lord, if that's the case, slay that giant of fear, Lord, and give us courage, knowing that if God be for us, who can be against us? Some might be kept back by friends. Lord, help us to realize that if we lose an earthly friend for Jesus' sake, you'll give us a hundred spiritual friends in this place. For some, it might be economics. It might be a job that's keeping us back from keeping your Sabbath. Lord, if such be the case, help us to realize that you have never seen the righteous forsaken nor your seed begging bread that you will give us a better work to do help us to have faith Lord that will grow and grow and grow and Lord if there's another reason represented here maybe it's something in our life that's a, a habit a body destroying vice I don't know if it's the case Lord please help us to realize that you are a God that can make the impossible possible you can take out of our life something that is destroying us a habit that is leading us back into the world. Lord, if it's loneliness that we have, help us realize that with Jesus as our best friend, that's all we really need. You'll give us the ultimate peace and comfort that comes from heaven. I want to ask for your special blessing on every person that was willing to come forward here to the front. They had the courage to step out from their seat and make that walk down here. Whatever their need is, Lord, minister to that need this morning in a special way reward them for their faith in coming forward and Lord I pray that you will give each one according as their need may be to some they need comfort to some they need conviction to some they need desire but whatever it is Lord you know and may you minister accordingly and we uh, we pray this according to Mark 11 verse 24 that whatever we ask whatever we desire when we pray we must believe that we receive it and we shall have it and so Lord help us to have faith to know that you are ministering right now and we thank you and we praise you this morning in Jesus' lovely name, amen.